Well, it's so good to be back at Williams. Thank you for allowing me to come and fill the pulpit today. It's always a challenge to me when I have this opportunity because you are used to such good preaching and I'd like to try to keep things up, <laughs> up to par. Uh, I tell you one thing though I observed this morning, I would have joined that children's group if I'd known there was gonna be treats. <laughs> no. And I'm sure some of you feel the same way. Our text this morning is from the second chapter of the book of the Acts, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this uh, particular text, but it's good for us to see it again. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of, our, of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is God's word for this day. Thanks be to God. As you may know, on the Christian calendar, this is the day of Pentecost. And I was glad to see you observing it in such a wonderful way with these beautiful red paraments. For red is the symbol of Pentecost because of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost is rooted in the ancient Jewish observance of the Feast of the Harvest, which came 50 days after Passover. For the Christian, Pentecost occurs 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. The picture here is that the apostles and others had gathered to observe the Jewish Feast of Pentecost. After all, they were still observing Jewish customs. Possibly they had gathered in the upper room where Jesus had observed the Last Supper with them. It was a place of memories. Little did they know the new memories which would shortly be formed. Little did they know that they were to be a part of the birthday of the church. Doubtless, they were depending on fellowship with one another because they felt so strongly the loss of the Lord. So today it is important that the church is a place of fellowship where people can feel cared for whatever their circumstances. Then three things happened which forever would shape their worship and ministry. First, we are told there was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. 
The scripture does not say that the wind blew things around, but there was a sound of the wind. Our area is more than familiar with tornadoes. I have heard persons who have experienced tornadoes talk about the sound that you hear. So it was with the disciples. They heard this sound which symbolized the power of God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who had come in mighty power to call out the church. If we are open to it, God still empowers the church. Too often, however, we are simply satisfied with the status quo. As I have told you before, the seven last words of the church are, we've never done it that way before. We should be praying for the power of God to fall on the church in such a way that it cannot be denied. The second thing that happened was that tongues of fire came and rested above the heads of the disciples. Fire is the symbol of the presence of God. These people were gathered in the upper room mourning the loss of the Lord. Suddenly God is among them in a way that they cannot deny. I haven't heard anyone claim to have seen tongues of fire, but because of the coming of the Holy Spirit, we know of the presence of God among us. The symbol of, coming, of the coming of God's Spirit and the symbol of the presence of God must have lifted people from despair to celebration. Then the third thing occurred. They began to speak in languages other than their own. These common people noticed that some of the folks said, they're just Galileans. In other words, they're the ignorant group among us. These common people now filled by the Spirit of God, probably who had never spoken anything in their lives but Aramaic, now were speaking in all kinds of languages so that their testimony of Jesus could be understood by people from all over the known world. In verse 9 through 11, you can see Luke's list of the people who had gathered in Jerusalem for Passover. No wonder they were amazed as they heard these disciples speaking to them in their own tongue. What a testimony to the power of God. Please note that these were known languages they were speaking. It was not what Paul refers to in Corinthians as glossolalia, which present day people have called the unknown tongue. We will not get into a discussion of that here, for it is more impressive that these simple folk could suddenly speak in foreign languages. And it is more important that people from around the world could hear the gospel for the first time. Let's go back to Luke's list of people present at Pentecost and recognize that we are being told that all these people are offered the opportunity to be included in the church through faith in Jesus Christ. Up to that time, the followers of Jesus were largely Jewish. They still followed most of the Jewish customs. Now, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, the church is born and its doors are thrown open to all who would enter. I think that the church needs to be honest with itself about whether all people are free to enter and are welcome. Of course, we would never admit that we are careful about whom we welcome. Still, we must hear the voice of Jesus who says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The birthday of the church, the coming of the Holy Spirit, what a wonderful time. Yet there are always doubters. It is almost amusing that here in the presence of God's great power, some of the people said of the disciples, they're just drunk. Even more amusing is Peter's refuting of the claim as he said, it's too early in the morning to be drunk. Yet these doubters did not stop the disciples. And that is the word to the church today to us, if you please. Do not let doubters stop you. 
Go on with the proclamation of the gospel regardless. Let the Holy Spirit lead us to those who need the gospel and then speak boldly the good news. What can we get out of this marvelous story? God still sends his Holy Spirit on believers. When we trust Jesus as Savior, the Holy Spirit baptizes us for the forgiveness of sins and comes to dwell in us. From that time on, we are to be filled with the Spirit. While the baptism of the Spirit occurs only when we are saved, the filling of the Spirit is repeated as often as need be to keep us following God's will for us. Notice, as Peter stands to boldly proclaim the gospel, he quotes a passage from the prophecy of Joel, which is God's promise of just such an occurrence. The birthday of the church had long been in the plan of God because people had been wandering from God for so long. And Peter ends the quote with this marvelous promise, and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So this morning, let us celebrate the birthday of the church as we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit into our lives. As the disciples proclaim the gospel through the power of God's Holy Spirit to people from everywhere, let us also be ready to offer this good news to everyone. Let us truly be God's people, surrendered to faith in Jesus our Lord, and empowered by God's Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, on this day when we remember that you sent your Holy Spirit to grip our lives and to make us different, to save us and give us a job to do, we want to once again thank you and recommit ourselves to you, that we may go from this place and invite others to be a part of the church and invite others to know that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.